Hi, this is Andy Hoffman, Media Director of Miles Franklin Precious Metals, celebrating our 25th year of business. It's Friday morning, early in the morning, given my schedule this weekend, and today's uh, audio blog is titled, It's No Longer Possible to Avoid the Word Bubble. Uh, look, I left Wall Street nine years ago. Incredible that it's been nine years, and gradually have disavowed everything I've ever learned there from my BS in finance, my CFA, and my 15 years of buy side, sell side, and trading experience. Since 2008, when the system broke, but particularly 2011, when the powers that be realized their initial bailout plans were failing, every aspect of what were once markets are now controlled by money printing, market manipulation, and propaganda. Frankly, I saw the, the first aspects of market uh, manipulation uh, particularly in the stock and, uh, and uh, precious metals markets, going all the way back to the post tech wreck uh, market. Really, it was 9-11 when I, when I think it started. And, uh, but again, what we've seen in the last few years as the system really has started to collapse has been unprecedented. Now, given that fundamental and technical analysis uh, no longer work, certainly not in the short term, I don't make valuation calls, and in fact, in all my years of writing this kind of blog, never really have. I don't buy paper securities of any kind, and don't advise anyone to do anything but protect themselves. That's the basis of what the Miles Franklin uh, blog is doing. And frankly, and until recently, I've never even discussed the term bubbles in markets, other than to say that the dollar was overowned being the reserve currency status and, and of course its abuse of such status and treasuries due to QE. Because frankly, either way, as I've said, uh, stocks could hyperinflate and thus you'll lose your money uh, in real terms or they can collapse like they did in 2008. I would say the odds of either one of those are equal. And since I don't own stocks, or recommend that anyone goes near them, it really doesn't matter to me. I'm in, I'm in it for financial defense right now, as I call it, uh, which is solely to protect myself from what I believe is coming, which is hyperinflation. However, it's getting more and more difficult to not recognize that bubbles are out there and expanding rapidly. Well, actually, some are starting to collapse like real estate, as I'll discuss in a second. But when you talk about record margin debt, which not only is 30% above the peak in 2007, but 100%, this is the New York Stock Exchange, above where it was at the peak in 2000, which in my mind was the most speculative market in the history of markets. I mean, what does that tell you? I, I put in my piece yesterday, a shocking chart I saw, that 83% of all the IPOs today are companies that are losing money. The only time this was higher was, yep, the peak in 1999 when that number was 84%. Forward PE levels are now at peak levels, and earnings quality is worse than ever. Heck, earnings quality, uh, weak earnings quality is now sanctioned by the Financial Accounting Standard Board. Uh, and of course, we've seen record uh, bull bear ratios, as, as uh, absolutely no one expects anything bad could possibly happen care of the uh, Greenspan put, Bernanke put, and now the Yellen put. In fact, I just read that 67 analysts, all 67, believe the economy will improve going forward. Incredible. Uh, now, let's see. On Thursday, I wrote of the good old days, uh, which was 2007. It was a great article by Michael Snyder saying uh, that basically there's an eerie similarity between today and and where we were in 2007, and that you're seeing collapsing uh, real estate and, and, spe and increased speculation, at least uh, by Wall Street. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that there are no comparison. 2007 was, in fact, the good old days compared to where we were today. I mean, back then, people did have a palpable wealth effect as, uh, as people were still in the stock market to some extent. And more importantly, people felt... The, uh, the wealth effect from their homes, which were largely above water. And, uh, you know, the home prices were dramatically higher than they were today, even after this minuscule dead cat bounce, uh, which has really only been in selected markets for the most part. I just read that 80% of new condo sales in Florida, New York, and Arizona are all cash. 
In other words, there's no people involved in this uh, recent uh, boom, as they call it. It's all Wall Street money that comes from the Fed. It's all speculation. And in fact, uh, there's a chart I saw showing new household formation is actually negative right now, meaning people are selling houses to move in with their parents. And this during a supposed housing recovery. Now, of course, the recovery is over. We know that pr pr not only have prices uh, um, already peaked, especially in these depressed markets that had the biggest jumps. Uh, Detroit's a, one of them, by the way, if that tells you how bastardized this rally has been. But we have now seen, just based on a tiny increase in mortgage rates, I mean, the Fed took mortgage rates to record low levels. I mean, I think it got as low as 3.5%. But just by going up a measly 1%, we've seen an utter collapse in, in, in home sales. We saw existing home sales yesterday were announced to have fallen 14% month over month. And there's no weather effect there. And it was they were expecting an increase, if you could believe that. And this is all because the Wall Street money is leaving. All it's done for the average person is made home, home affordability uh, reduced. And now the Wall Street money is racing out. And if you look at the chart of the actual home price index, you'll see that it really wasn't much of a gain to start with. Um, and particularly if the Fed was tapering, which of course it's not. Uh, but look, at some point they're going to have to say, they're going to have to say overtly that we're not tapering. Will it be at next week's Fed meeting? I don't know. It would be pretty scary if Yellen, just a month into her term or two months in, already had to say that. But you can bet, as we saw in her speech last week, when she said uh, when she said that maybe she was uh, speaking off the cuff when she said that rates would uh, would uh, rise within six months of, uh, of of tapering ending. I think you're going to see even more dovishness going forward. And uh, you know, more importantly, I think the most important article that we've written here in the last who knows six months was in early January. We wrote a piece called. 3.0 percent, enough said. And in it, we postulated that the Fed cannot ever let the 10-year Treasury rate go over 3.0 percent because that's the rate that most mortgages are based on. And frankly, it's the rate that more rates in the world are based on than anything, uh, aside from LIBOR. <laughs> and we know about LIBOR. Uh, so, but basically, the point was that any time rates get near 3%, the Fed will do anything it can to taper either covertly, to, uh, to QE either covertly or, or, uh, or overtly, such as putting out bad unemployment reports or, or, or whatnot, or having Belgium buy treasury bonds, <laughs> uh, as if anyone realize, anyone thinks that that's not the ECB that's secretly funding that. Uh, but what I wrote today, my article that should be out within hours, was called it uh, something like 3% no longer matters. Because I think we've, what we've seen is the diminishing returns of taking interest rates down to nothing have played themselves out. I mean, we barely budged off of, the, off of those all-time lows, and housing is already collapsing. And on top of that, I mean, just look at John uh, Williams' uh, statistics as to what the real first quarter numbers were for durable goods and real uh, re retail sales and industrial production. I mean, they were bad enough as it is, but when you take out the impact that the that the uh, fudge numbers and the diffusion indices uh, kind of mask, I mean, we're talking about we're in free fall right now. I mean, the uh, the holiday season, as we know, is the worst since the bottom in 2008, 2009, and it's continued into the first quarter. And as we wrote in Mother Nature's Had Enough, the weather really has nothing to do with it. It certainly hasn't helped, but it really has had nothing to do with it. And thus, it's only a matter of time before it gets recognized by, uh, by Janet and company that it's time to stop even talking about uh, this uh, political trial balloon of tapering, which never happened. And now the problem is that this time around, when the economy weakens, will they be able to get interest rates to fall, uh, either with increased QE or jawboning or dovishness? Because at some point, remember, we're seeing international selling of treasuries right now. The Chinese said famously in November, the PBOC said it is no longer in China's interest to continue accumulating currency reserves, which means we are selling U.S. dollar assets. And, and sure enough, in December, the Chinese sold 49 billion of U.S. treasuries alone. We saw one particular week in March a few weeks ago 
where there were 104 billion of treasury sales by foreigners. So clearly no one is buying, which means the Fed is only going to have to increase QE. Obviously, it's going to have to do it overtly at some point. But will that actually get rates down or will that catalyze a wholesale fleeing due to fears of hyperinflation? I mean, it's going to come. That is the end game. It's just a matter of what catalyzes it and when. And of course, if they can't hold the gold and silver prices down any longer, it's only going to catalyze that much quicker because once uh, gold and silver start rising, those barometers of inflation will scare the entire world. And we know that, that that demand is tight since we've seen record demand around the world. And now we have backwardation of uh, gold forward rates out to six months. We've never had anything like this before. This is as tight as it gets for wholesale gold purchases as it's ever been. Now, just to summarize the week's economic data, I, I love how, you know, the gold got hit on Thursday at exactly 10 o'clock, uh, just before the, uh, you know, the end of the COMEX options expiration, because the um, Richmond, man oh, Tuesday, when the Richmond Manufacturing Index went from minus seven to seven, as if that diffusion index means anything, but it ignored, of course, Monday's Chicago Fed National Activity Index, which was flat at a barely positive reading. Then on Tuesday, we had existing home sales were down 7.5% year over year. Wednesday, mortgage purchase applications and refinancing indices down 4% from a week ago to a new 20-year low. The PMI manufacturing index was down for the month compared to an expected increase. New home sales, as we said, down 14% from last month compared to a 4% expected increase. Thursday jobless claims 329,000 versus 313 expected and the KC manufacturing index fell from 10 to 7. So and of course the uh, gold didn't go up on any of these because it was options expiration week and we couldn't have all those 1300 calls expire uh, in the money could we with so little gold uh, on the comics to start with. Uh, incidentally there's about there's been about 500,000 plus ounces standing for delivery for months now. Uh, against an inventory, a registered inventory of no more than 800,000 ounces, but somehow they never get delivered. And somehow the <laughs> the exchange keeps going on. How much longer? I don't know, but I can't see the COMEX being the world's price-setting mechanism uh, for much longer. Uh, a couple other things during the week. Uh, yesterday, I put it as the top quote in my article this morning, Draghi literally came out and said they are preparing for QE. As he continues to say there's deflation, as the cost of living in Europe is at an all-time high or close to it. Japan, how about last night? 2.9% year-over-year CPI, which is well above the 2%, 2.0% that Shinzo Abe wants. Unfortunately, nothing is working in Abenomics, which is celebrating its one-year anniversary this week, as we now have record inflation, we have a record low in Shinzo Abe's approval rating, and the Nikkei hasn't moved up in a year. And not only that, wages have fallen for 21 straight months. I, again, I couldn't, I can't be more vociferous in my belief that Japan will be the first of the modern uh, world power nations to see hyperinflation. Something very, very terrible is going to happen there very soon. How about China? The yuan, as I speak, is at a new low, a new multi-year low, 6.2489, right at that 6.25 level. There are $500 billion of derivatives that were betting that the yuan would be strengthening against the dollar. But now that the final currency war has expanded, particularly with Abenomics uh, and soon to be with, uh, with the ECB and launching its own uh, QE, and of course when Whirly Bird Janet increases hers, we've now seen all those derivatives start to move into the negative. I mean, there's going to be a derivatives collapse in, in China, uh, either based on uh, the shadow shadow banking industry collapse or these derivatives and the fact that even you have tiny little declines in the yuan have enormous implications for global inflation and manufacturing market share uh, so you know get ready for more currency debauchery and more inflation um, oh and speaking of inflation I didn't even have this in my notes but I just saw this morning that Safeway which is the second largest uh, retail um, supermarket chain in America, and it's where I buy my food, 
Uh, they had some really terrible losses last year, and they just allowed themselves to be bought out by Wall Street venture capitalists. Well, apparently they said, we've been eating price inflation for, for a whole year, and now we're not going to do it anymore. Uh, so if you look at the CRB Foodstuffs Index, which I put a graph of it in today's piece, it is literally up 20% just since the beginning of this year alone, let alone what it was doing last year. So we are about to see some major, major price increases, and those droughts in California and Brazil have not let up at all. Uh, so again, you know, we wrote an article last year called The Most Important Reason to Own Precious Metals, and the answer was food inflation. So for those who are sitting on their hands with gold trading well below the cost of production, and silver for that matter, um, I think the time is now. And again, I can't emphasize more how important this announcement this week, or these trades, uh, these rumors swirling about Barrick Gold and Newmont Mining merging, this is the third time in the past five years that they've had major merger talks because these, the two largest gold mining companies in the world, which together produce 13% of the world's gold, are on the verge of bankruptcy. New, uh, Barrick barely survived uh, getting out of bankruptcy this year with its dilutive deals and selling off properties. These companies cannot produce gold at $1,300 an ounce. The CEO of Goldfield said we need $1,500. And for silver, I think the price is well above $30 to sustain the industry, let alone make it profitable. Uh, so again, this is the time to look into it. Silver Eagles, just going uh, non sequitur, but still on the topic of, of physical demand. Every week, the, the U.S. Mint is rationing about 1.2 million ounces, and every week they go in the first two days. I mean, we're 27 percent above last year's record level. And last year, if you remember, we sold seven and a half million ounces in the in January because they weren't rationing, which they are now. I mean, we're talking about torrid, torrid demand for physical silver. And, uh, and of course, I told you about the backwardation in gold. Okay, well, that's enough for today. I'm waiting with bated breath for Wednesday's FOMC meeting to see how Whirly Bird Janet follows up last week's asinine speech saying she expected full employment and stable inflation by the end of 2016, or three years from now. History says the bankers are always wrong and always lose, as fiat currency is nothing but a Ponzi scheme that always fails. This is why you need to consider protecting your net worth now while there's still a chance. And if you do, we hope you'll call Miles Franklin at 800-822-8080 and give us a chance to earn your business. And as always, you can contact me with questions at ahoffman at milesfranklin.com. Thanks and have a great weekend.